And we're looking at the book of Joshua. And last week, we kind of looked at the story before what we're going to read today. And so in the book of Joshua, um, they had wandered in the wilderness before this for about 40 years. And the reason was because uh, they disobeyed God. They, uh, they gave in to their fears. They had the 12 spies go into the land. You remember me telling the story last week. And they brought back two of the guys, had a good report. And they said, we need to go forward. God's with us. We're going to conquer this land. But there are 10 that said, no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't do this. There are giants there. And they gave in to their fear. And I believe that there are a lot of people that give in to fear in their life. We live in a time of constant fear, don't we? People are afraid of COVID-19. And I'm not suggesting that we should not be uh, concerned for our health or do what we, is necessary uh, to uh, protect our health. But a lot of people are afraid, not just of that disease, but they're afraid of what's going to happen in the world, what's going to happen to the economy, what's going to happen to their job, what's going to happen to their family. And a lot of people live in fear. And so today, I want to talk to you about what to do when you're afraid. What do you do when fear seems to overwhelm you? What do you do when everything in your world seems to be crashing around you? What do you do when you're afraid? Now, if we're honest, everybody has fears. Even the macho guy that seems not to be afraid of anything. I always kind of prided myself, and it's male ego, it's male pride, I know that, but I always kind of prided myself that I wasn't really afraid of anything growing up. And I did a lot of things that were probably dumb. Uh, I went bungee jumping one time, and uh, I thought it was kind of fun. Probably not the smartest thing to do in the world, uh, but anyway, I thought that was kind of fun. I actually went with my son on a walking safari in South Africa, and we walked through Kruger National Park, and we walked up within 50 yards of two lions and they began to roar at us and let us know that we were not to come any closer and I stood there brave but my knees were a knocking all right because I was afraid on the inside I didn't show it on the outside done a lot of things in my life that uh, probably weren't the smartest uh, because I was just trying to put on that macho image I've actually caught uh, a rattlesnake one time with my bare hands uh, and held it, put it in a jar, caught a copperhead one time, not really afraid of snakes. But even as much of that macho image that I have tried to give off all of my life, there's one thing I'm very, very afraid of. Would you like to know what it is? Spiders. I, do, I, I can be next to a lot. I don't know why. I, well, actually, I do know why. When I was about five years old, I was running through the woods. And y'all have seen these, uh, I don't know what they're called. I call them banana spiders, but they're black and yellow and they're about that big around. You know what I'm talking about? And they weave those webs. They've got the little zigzag thing. Well, I was just the right size running through the woods. And I ran with my face smack into that spider web. And that spider got on my face as a five-year-old boy. And ever since then, I've been terrified of spiders. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. But nevertheless, it's, it's a crazy thing. I'm even afraid of little spiders. Now, if a little bitty tiny one that you can barely see, I'll, I'll smash it and go on with my day. But I was driving my car one time, driving down the road, minding my own business, and a little tiny spider, not bigger than the head of an eraser, somehow or another got on me and I literally almost had a wreck trying to get away from that stupid spider while I'm driving down the car at 65 miles an hour. And we all have fears of some kind. We don't want to admit it, but we do. Uh, when I was about six years old, uh, my dad took our family to an amusement park. And uh, we were at this amusement park that supposedly had the fastest roller coaster in the world. And I wanted to ride it. Of course, I rode it. And my dad 
was very, very abusive, you know, let, letting me ride that. I'm just kidding. He was not. But he thought it was funny that I got on that roller coaster and I was terrified as a six-year-old boy. But he wanted to ride it again. And right beside us was an old man. Now, I don't mean old like as a six-year-old will look at a 30-year-old and think that person's old. I'm talking about a man that walked with a cane. He was elderly. And he had never ridden a roller coaster before. And uh, so my dad talked this old man <laughs> into getting on the roller coaster with him. And he looks at him. He says, now, sir, here's what you got to do. When you ride a roller coaster, when it starts to go down the hill, you got to throw your hands up in the air just like this. And I sat there and watched my dad with this old man. And uh, the old man, he had a smile on his face, no teeth. You know, he just like having a good time. And that thing, you know, kind of inched its way up to the top. And this old man, he raises his feeble arms up in the air. And as soon as that thing started going down the hill, he squalled like nobody I've ever heard in my life. He goes, whoa, and grabbed the bar, the handlebar in front of him. And they literally had to pry his hands off of the bar when the roller coaster stopped. Now, why would I tell you that? I really don't know. I just thought it was funny, but nevertheless... But no, I'm illustrating that we all have fears. We all have fears. Now, I don't know what your fears are. Maybe you fear because of something that happened to you in your past. You don't want anybody to know about it. Maybe you're afraid for people to get to know the real you. Maybe you're afraid your spouse won't love you. It's going to leave you. Maybe you're afraid for the future of your kids because you watch too much news and all it is is bad news. Maybe you're afraid for your health. Maybe you're afraid that your finances are going to run out. Maybe you're afraid of your job closing down and you're not going to be able to have a job. I do know this, that no matter who you are, you have fears. And we're going to read today what God said to Joshua. Now, you would think that Joshua was a brave man. He was. He was the general of the Israelites. He was Moses' assistant. And now he was the leader of the nation of Israel. He had seen God do miracles. He had seen God part the Red Sea. That would embolden you a little bit, wouldn't it? You knew that God had that much power. He had seen God rain down manna out of heaven for 40 years. God provided for them manna out of heaven. He saw how that God provided meat for them by bringing birds in, little quail in, and they were able to eat their fill. He saw when they were in a desert and there was no water with probably two and a half million Israelites that God provided water out of a rock incredible what God did for them you would think that he would not be afraid but God repeatedly told him don't be afraid don't be afraid don't be afraid why would God say that probably because he was afraid and so let's begin reading in Joshua chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 1 through 9 and after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord the Lord said to Joshua the son of Nun Moses assistant Moses My servant is dead. Now, therefore, rise and go over this Jordan. You and all this people, he's talking about the scholars believe probably two and a half million Israelites that had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. You and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the land of the Hittites to this great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. And no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. That's a powerful promise from God. He was saying that he was going to defeat all of his enemies. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. 
I will not leave you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. God's trying to build them up. Be strong, be courageous, be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my service, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will... Uh, make your way prosperous and then you will have good success have I not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you whithersoever you go what do you do when you're afraid Heavenly Father I pray that you'd help us today to see from the Word of God how powerful you are, how strong you are, how you promise to us that you will always be with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. And I pray that you'd help all of us, each of us in this room today, each of the people watching online today, to be able to deal with the things that we're terrified of, to deal with the things that we're afraid that may overcome us. God, may we turn these things to you and see your great and glorious power. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, I want to give you just three thoughts, and you can write these things down. I think it'll be a help to you if you'll remember these three things. What do you do when you're afraid? First thing is this. you got to deal with the past. We're taking this right from the text of what God told to Joshua. And one of the things that's kind of shocking, it's kind of, it seems a little unkind, but it's really not. One of the things that's shocking, though, is here's what he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. You know what God's saying to him there? This is the past, and you got to deal with it. And it's kind of like the Eagles song, you know, just get over it. And God was not being unkind. God was challenging him and these people that they had to learn to deal with their past. And if you do not deal with your past, and if you don't stop thinking about it and living in the past, it is going to overwhelm you, and it's going to make you live in fear. I want to give you just a couple of thoughts in dealing with your past. How do you deal with your past? Well, first, the thing, first thing you got to do is you got to get honest with yourself. God was really, really honest and very clear. Moses is dead. Moses is not coming back, Joshua. He's not going to be here to rescue you. He's not going to be here to lead these people. He's not going to be here to encourage you. Moses is dead. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not suggesting that people don't need counseling. I, I've been through counseling, and Kim and I have been through counseling, and I can honestly say that there have been some uh, counseling sessions that I believe saved my life, saved my ministry, saved my marriage. So I'm not suggesting that you don't deal properly with uh, the, the things that are in your past. But one of the things that we must do is just what God told Joshua, Moses, my service, servant is dead. You got to get honest with yourself about your past. You got to be honest about it. You can't bury it. You can't deny that it's there. And you certainly cannot live in the past. You see, if you don't deal with the past, but rather you live in the past, then it's going to limit your future. Now, some people don't deal with the past, and they don't, they don't acknowledge it. They don't acknowledge the pain. They don't acknowledge the problems. They don't acknowledge the failure. They don't acknowledge the hurt that has happened to them. And what happens? They constantly live in fear. They live under a cloud. And that's not what God wants for your life. God, in his own way, told Joshua, deal with the past. Moses is dead. You've got to get honest with yourself. And then I think another thing you've got to do is you've got to grieve appropriately. Now, did you know that it is okay to grieve? I know some people think that, um, you know, when a person has a loss, maybe a relative of some kind, 
that if that person cries or they're sad, they're like, okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And, you know, a lot of people don't know how to deal with people like that much beyond the funeral. And, and what they do is they suppress the honest and healthy grieving process. Do you know that there are things in your past that you need to grieve over? Obviously, if you lose a, a family member, if you lose a child, you need to, there is deep grieving that goes along with that. And did you know that uh, that's a biblical thing? We know the story of King David. And you know the story of how he, he killed Goliath. And uh, God elevated him. He became a mighty, mighty warrior. He became the most beloved king in Israel's history. But we also know that at the height of his fame and the height of his power, he failed. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had her husband. He tried to cover it up uh, because she got pregnant. And uh, he tried to cover it up with uh, her husband. His name was Uriah. And he wasn't having it. And uh, David set him up where he would be killed in battle. And the, one of the most troublesome things about what David did was he did this in a place of power. And he abused his power. And we know that David um, had sinned and he admitted his sin to God. But did you know that the child that was born as a result of that liaison between David and and Bathsheba is that child was going to die and David he began to fast and pray and beg God to spare the life of the child and oh he, he wouldn't eat they tried to comfort him he wouldn't be comforted and then the child died and they were afraid they were afraid to bring the news to him because they said if he was acting this way when the child was still alive what is he going to do when he hears the news that the child is dead and they brought him the bad news and David did the strangest thing he got up he washed himself anointed himself with oil and um, whatever you know appropriate colognes I guess or whatever and he he went and he sat down to eat and they asked him they said what in the world happened David when the child was alive you were praying you were crying you were fasting you wouldn't be comforted by anyone and he said well when the child was alive I was praying that who knew but that God would spare the child but then he said this he said he can't come back to me but I will go to him and in David's own way, you know what he did? He grieved appropriately for himself. What he was saying was, I understand what God has done. I won't be able to see that child here on earth again. However, I will one day see that child in heaven. That's what he was saying. And my point is this. You need to learn to grieve appropriately. If it's the death of a loved one, a child, a parent, a relative, a friend that you work with, Someone that you know maybe that was taken early in their life, their life was cut short because of COVID-19. Grieve. Grieve appropriately. But then when it's time, and nobody knows how long you should grieve. There is no magic number. There is nothing that says, hey, I can only grieve for a few weeks and, uh, and then not feel sad anymore. That is just simply not true. Uh, it may take you years to grieve. But the point is this, you need to grieve appropriately. But it's not just about death, it's about other loss, the loss of a job. Grieve the appropriate amount of time. Grieve about that loss. Uh, pour out your heart to God. Did you know that in the book of Psalms, that over half of the Psalms were, were written by David when he was grieving? He was grieving the loss. He was grieving how people seemed to be defeating him. He was grieving how his enemies maybe won a victory over him. He was grieving over his failure. But I want you to understand how David grieved. He grieved. He said, God, it seems like you're not even here anymore. It seems like you're not hearing and answering my prayers. It seems like the heavens are brass. And every time I pray, it seems like it bounces off the ceiling. 
And he dealt with his feelings, his emotions, but he always came back to this, to his faith. He said, yeah, it feels like you're not here, God, but I know that you are the Savior. I know that your hand is strong. I know that you will be with me. And I want to tell you this, that whatever it is that you're grieving about, whatever loss it is, whatever it is about your past, maybe it's a lost opportunity. Maybe you blew it because you were late to an appointment and you lost a great opportunity to make some money. Or maybe you lost a job when it was unfair. Or maybe you lost a relationship. Maybe a husband or a wife divorced you and it was not your fault. Grieve. Grieve appropriately, but always come back to this, just like David did. Deal with your feelings. Deal with them honestly, but end up with your faith. Because even though it may feel like the pain will never end, and even though it may feel like that you're never going to get better, And even though it may feel like that you're never going to feel whole again, you will. And God is with you. And you need to acknowledge your feelings, but express your faith. You say, well, what if I don't feel like God is with me? You still acknowledge it because he is. And when you say it, I believe that God uh, begins to, to bless you in that. So grieve, and then you need to learn to release forgiveness when necessary. You know, all of us have past hurts, and sometimes that brings fear. Like I said, for some people, it's a divorce or uh, a loss like that, and you're terrified. And you want to be in a relationship again. You want to be married again, but you're afraid. And until you deal with the fear, and until you release forgiveness you're not going to be the kind of spouse that you want to be. you got to learn to release forgiveness when necessary, even when someone has hurt you terribly. I realize that for many people, there is abuse in their past. And the pain from that, I just cannot even imagine. For others, there have been such grievous hurts in your past that it just feels like it left a hole in your soul and I acknowledge that and I think God acknowledges that and he understands it Jesus himself and the writers that wrote about Jesus said that he was one that understands our weaknesses he understands our pain because he went through everything that we have experienced you feel abandoned Jesus felt it you feel hurt Jesus felt it. You feel rejected, Jesus felt it too. And the truth is, when we deal with those hurts, the only way that you'll find closure in them is by releasing forgiveness. You know, you remember the story when um, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how often should we forgive till seven times? And you have to understand the context of that. Uh, the, the Jewish thought process was that you forgive three times and after that it's hammer time. You know what I mean? I mean, you bring the hammer down, you bring whatever, you bring the rage, you bring whatever is necessary to get vengeance on that person. And so Peter, being kind of the spokesman for the disciples, he like doubled it plus one. He was so proud of himself. I could see him like if he had buttons, they would almost be bursting off because he was so proud of how spiritual he was. And he's like, uh, Jesus, how often should we forgive? Till seven times. And he almost dislocated his arm, patting himself on the back. And Jesus, you know, I don't, we don't really read what his physical expressions were. But sometimes from the words that he said, I get the idea that he was thinking, you guys are so stupid, <laughs> you know? And, uh, uh, or, or like, are you guys ever going to learn anything that I've ever taught you? And he, he looks at Peter, he's like, till seven times? He said, no, until 70 times seven. And it kind of blew their mind. Now, was Jesus saying that after 490 times, it's hammer time? No, he's not saying that. 
I believe he's saying a couple things about this. Number one, forgiveness is often a process. You need to learn to speak the words, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. Even if you don't feel like you. So, well, that would be hypocritical. No, it's not. It is a statement of faith. And the more you say it, the more you can release forgiveness. And, you know, it doesn't have to be over even big things. If someone has harmed you and hurt you deeply, you're going to have to deal with the emotions because I promise you, even after you forgive and God releases that burden off of you, you're going to see that person out or see a picture on Facebook and those feelings are going to come back. And it may take 490 times. I don't know. And, And so what Jesus was saying was sometimes it's a process. The second thing he was saying is we need to live this as a lifestyle. You see, if you and I do not practice forgiving, especially from the things in our past, you know what's going to happen to us? We are going to carry a burden, and we're going to carry anger, and we will become bitter. And you know who that hurts? Not the person that hurt you. In fact, and this is one of the things of forgiveness, sometimes the person that hurt you doesn't ever think about it again. And so forgiveness is for you to understand God's love for you, to understand how much God forgives you, but it's also for you. And the more you begin to forgive, and the more you begin to release it, even when you don't feel like it, the more you begin to do this, you know what happens? You begin to live a lifestyle of forgiveness. And before you know it, that burden, that anger, that bitterness is gone. I've seen it so many times. I've seen it in my own life. There have been people that have said things about me and to me that angered me so much that I, every time I saw them, it just like welled up inside of me and I wanted to just go do something to them um, when they weren't looking, you know? (laughs) So, but I had to learn to, free. there's, there's a guy that said, I won't go into it, but I, every time I saw him and he walked in our neighborhood, I was like, Lord, can I just hit him one time? Just once, you know, boom, boom, just, just like, just quit, you know? And the more I saw him, the angrier I got and until one day God convicted me. He said, son, you teach everybody else about forgiveness and you're not doing it yourself. And I had to say, When I saw him, I forgive you. I didn't say it to him. I wasn't about to speak to him, all right? You know, that would require me looking him in the eyes, and I wasn't about to do that. And you know what? I got a little bit of release, but the next time I saw him walking in our neighborhood, I still wanted to hit him in my car. And you know what I did? I said, God, help me. I forgive him. Wasn't quite as much through clenched teeth. And I want you to understand something. Forgiveness does not equal enabling. If you're in an abusive relationship and that person's beating you, forgiveness does not mean you need to let them keep beating you. That's not what it means. Oh, well, he didn't mean anything by it. I know he really loves me. No, you need to leave his butt. Okay? You need to protect yourself. And, and look, here's the point. You're going to have to practice it. And you're going to have to release it. And you're going to have to release it again. And again. And again. And I eventually, even with that little silly thing that really wasn't that big of a deal, to be honest, he said something to me that enraged me in front of a group of people. And um, it took me a while to release it. But I did. And now when I see him, I pray for him. And we sold our house and moved out of that neighborhood so I don't have to see him anymore. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying though, right? You got to release forgiveness. And then what you got to do in, in dealing with the past, you got to take your next step. You got to take your next step. He said, arise and go over into that land. You and I, 
if we're not careful, we'll get stuck in the past or because of the past. And you've got to leave it there. Learn from it. Don't repeat it. Forgive. Deal with it. And go on. And that's what God wants us to do in dealing with our fears. Here's the second thing. you got to remember God's promise. Now, there were so many promises that God made to Joshua in this passage that we just read. Let me just give you a few. The promise of success when you serve God's purpose. He said, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. You want success? Live for God's purpose. Now, there are many things you can be successful in, and to be quite honest, it's not going to matter. You know, you've heard this said before about people that spent all of their life climbing the ladder of success, and when they got to the top, they found out that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Don't be that person. But God promises success when you follow his purpose. He, he gave him a promise to be with you. He said, just as I, am with Mo, I was with Moses, uh, so will I be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. God promises to be with you. He promises not to leave you alone. Even in the middle of the night, when you're crying yourself to sleep, God is with you. Even when you feel neglected and rejected, God is with you. He will never leave you alone. Thank God. He promises to be with you. He gave him the promise of strength. He said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And I just want to tell you from the word of God and from the mouth of God that God promises to give you strength for what you're going through. When you follow him, he will get you through what you're going through. And I think a lot of people need to be reminded of that. It's going to be okay. You know why we know it's going to be okay? Because of Jesus. Now, I don't know if your circumstance is going to get better. I do know this. It's going to get better one day because the Bible tells us that we're going to be in the presence of God for all of eternity and that Jesus is coming again and that our bodies, if we die before Jesus comes again, are going to be resurrected and we're going to be reunited with him throughout all of eternity. And I know one day there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. There will be no more crying. There will be no more death. There will be no more sickness or disease. And forever, in all of eternity, we're going to have joy and we're not going to have to deal with all the crap we have to deal with down here. And so we got to remember the promise. He promises to give us strength. Um, he says that you can be strong and grow strong. That, that word, growing strong, it means to harden as in resolve, to bind about or to gird. Let me give you a just a couple of visual illustrations about that. Uh, you, what you and I need to do is uh, hardening as in your resolve. It's like the idea of concrete that gets hard. I, I don't know if you ever watched people pour concrete. When they first pour it, you can scratch your name into it and it'll be there. But once it gets hard, you're not scratching anything into it. And, and so what God says is sometimes you don't, it's not saying have a hard heart, but he's saying harden your resolve. Be determined. Don't give up. Just because it doesn't work the first time or just because it doesn't feel right the first time, don't stop. Keep going. Be strong. And then the other idea there, that word uh, grow strong or be strong, uh, it means to, to bind about or to gird about. Do you remember Ephesians chapter 6 when the Apostle Paul was writing, he was describing the whole armor of God. You know, one of the first things they put on was the belt of truth. They gird that truth. Now, does that refer to the Word of God? Maybe, but the Word really means the belt of truthfulness, being honest with yourself. Girding your life with the truth of the Word of God. Knowing what God says, and you trust His promises more than your circumstances, because faith always trumps facts. 
without fail, your faith in God will trump the facts that you're facing in life. It may seem like the fact is that there's no hope for you, but there is hope for you because God says there is, and he is with you, and he will give you strength. You don't have to give up because your faith is stronger than the facts that are around you. Gird yourself with truth. You say, well, I don't know, man. I just feel so uh, worthless. I don't feel like I can do anything. I feel like that I've lost hope. Well, it doesn't matter what somebody else says about you. The fact is your past may be filled with things like you can't do that. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're stupid. There's no, I don't even know why you were ever born. I'm, if I had it to do over, I would never have you. And I know many of you have heard those kinds of words. But you, <laughs> the fact is, that somebody may have said that to you, that lodged deep in your heart and deep in your soul. But you know what faith tells us? That God says to you, you are beloved. There will never be a day that you're not loved. You are a son or a daughter of God. He says you are more than a conqueror. He says we're going to be kings and priests and serve him for all of eternity. He promises that he will be with us. We're never alone. You may feel rejected, but through God you're accepted. You may feel all alone, but God is always with you. And the fact may be that you have been told all your life that you can't, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, but faith tells us that God says, yes, I am because of him. Yes, you are because of him. Not because of you, not because of your goodness, but because of him, because of Jesus. Well, he gave them a lot of promises. He said, don't be frightened, don't be dismayed. The word dismayed means to break into pieces, to deprive of courage or deprive of resolution and initiative through the pressure of sudden fear or anxiety. Does that not describe how we act a lot of times? The pressure gets to us, we break to pieces. We lose our resolve. We lose our determination. And after one time, we feel like, well, that didn't work. Really? You're going to give up after one time? Well, that was a waste of time. Really? Didn't you learn anything from it? Can you not find somewhere that God worked in your life from it? The truth is, he said, don't be dismayed. And you know, the only way that you can avoid being dismayed is by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Because he will never let you down. He gave them the promise of guidance. He said, Uh, that he would be with us. He said, don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. He gives us the promise of prosperity. He says, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. By the way, he's referring, if you read the text, he says, when you obey the word of God, when you meditate on it, when you think on it, when you read the Bible, when you obey this, you're gonna have success. Now, does reading the Bible give you success in the classroom? I'm not saying that you should not study. I think that would be foolish. But I do believe that when we read God's word, we'll find that God says he'll be with us. He'll uh, he'll help us. And, uh, you know, I prayed a lot of prayers over tests when I was in college. You know, God will help me. And God was like, yeah, you should have studied, you know. So I'm not suggesting that you know, you'd be like, I, I knew a guy in college. He was always asking everybody to pray for him to get a job. Pray for him to get a job. He never got a job. I was like, man, what in the world? Pray for me to get a job. He did that for a solid month, the first semester I was in college, uh, in the dorm. Pray for me. I need to get a job. I got a job the first day. You know why? I actually went out and applied for a job. And comes to find out, this guy never even looked for a job. He's like, pray for me a job. And I'm like, Do you really think that God's going to send your boss out to the dorm here in college and seek you out and get you out of bed in the afternoon and say, we would sure love to hire you. Would you sign here? No, you got to get up and you got to go out. And I think often we think that, um, that we don't have a part to play, but we do. And faith always requires action. 
In the book of James, it says faith without works is dead. And so God wants your faith to be active. And that brings me to the last thing. Speak in faith. I want you to see what he said. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Talking about the Bible. Shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do it according to all that is written in it. Now, he talks about meditating. He talks about thinking about it. Incredibly important. But I want you to notice what he said. This law shall not depart from your mouth. Shouldn't it say mind? This law shall not depart from your mind. You need to think about it. Or this law shall not depart from your heart. Get it in your heart. Believe it. Think about it. Trust it. He didn't say that. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Now, what in the heck does that mean? Your mouth? God, seriously? What does that mean? I, I, I'm, I'm to, like, put the Bible in my mouth? What am I supposed to do? No. It's really talking about, yeah, you're to meditate on it, you're to read it, you're to think about it. But the idea of it being in your mouth is an active action of faith. This law shall not depart from your mouth. When you're afraid, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That is the word of God in your mouth. And you speak it. If I've got enough faith to be saved, God said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, it is in our mouth when we speak it and we speak God's word over our circumstances. We remember God's promises and we say it out loud over our fears and over what we're facing. And God has promised to be with you when you say it, when you repeat it, when you speak it, this Bible passage, this word of God shall not depart from your mouth. And in fact, did you know that that's how Jesus dealt with the devil? He said, it is written. Jesus was taken out at the beginning of his ministry for 40 days. He fasted in the wilderness. And the Bible says the devil tempted him. And with every temptation, Jesus said, it is written. It is written. It is written. You know what he was doing? He was not letting that book of the law depart from his mouth. Even though he was the word of God, he is the word of God, and he was the one that authored it. And so my point is this. We're to speak words of faith from God's word. We're to meditate on God's word. We're to obey it. But we need to repeat the word of God in our temptation to help us face our fears, to help us through our problems, to help us pray for our children, to help us pray for our loved ones, to help us pray for our church. God said, speak it, speak it, believe it, trust God to do it. And you know what will happen? He will. He will be with you. And he will do everything that he's promised to do in the word of God. And your life will be better. And your fears, you'll conquer them. Oh, you know what? There are things that I'm still afraid of. But when I get afraid, I just speak God's word over my life. There are things I'm afraid that may not work out. But when I start feeling that temptation in my mind that I, that I want to be timid, that I don't want to have courage, that I don't want to be bold, that I don't want to trust God anymore. I just speak God's word in my life. And it, it overcomes the fear. It conquers the fear. And that's what God wants for you as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your promises from the word of God that you give to us. And they're so wonderful and so amazing. And Lord, I pray that you'd help every person here today that needs you to follow you. I pray for those that need to be saved that today they would speak in faith just like you said that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let them call out to you in faith and help them to know that 
you give them the faith when they're willing to ask. They don't have to say magic words. They don't have to repeat after the preacher. But they do need to speak out and ask you in faith. And I pray that right now, those online that need that will do it. Those in the room will do that that need it. Jesus talked about accepting him publicly. If today you need Christ as your Savior, I want to lead you and once again, not magic words, but it's your act of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ that saves you. Jesus did everything that was necessary on the cross. He died for our sins. He died the death that we deserved. He rose from the grave. He's alive today. And if you call on him, he will save you. Say something like this in your heart. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I ask you to come into my life and to save me and to change me and to lead me. And I believe that you raised from the dead and that you're alive today and you have the power, the power to change my life. If you'll pray that prayer, if you prayed it today online, please click the button at the bottom of the page there and let us know that you prayed to receive Christ so we can help you take your next step. If you prayed that prayer today in the room, here's what I want you to do. Fill out the next step card and let us know today that you prayed to receive Christ. There's a spot on there that says, I pray to receive Christ today. That's your next step. Just check that box. Give us your name and contact information, and we will follow up with you. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor, before you finish praying, I need help with some fears. Got some fears in my life. Afraid. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be about anything. But you'd say, I need God to help me, just like he helped Joshua, to deal with the fears that I have in my life. And I want you to pray that God will help me to do that. Would you just raise your hand, anybody like that in the room today? Yeah, a lot of hands. A lot of hands. We all have fears. We all have fears. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to give these fears to you because you do not give the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Father, we thank you today for the word of God. We thank you for how it guides us and blesses us and teaches us and leads us. And I pray that you'd help each of us now to follow you with all of our heart. Thank you for those that prayed to receive Christ today. Thank you for those that were here today. Thank you for those that watched today. I pray that you'd help us have a great week and commit our life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.